Pastor Josh Dockstetter here from Centerpoint Church in Montague, Prince Edward Island. Thank you for viewing this sermon from one of our weekly worship meetings. I do hope that it will encourage and challenge you towards a maturity in Christ. We at Centerpoint believe in the local church, and we want to remind you that this sermon should only support the role and influence that your pastor and church family should have on your life and not replace it. If you aren't a part of the local church, I want to simply say, don't rob yourself of the presence of others in gospel community, and don't rob others of your presence in gospel community. Find a church that preaches the word of God, makes much of Jesus, and is committed to discipleship. And may the following sermon enrich you in the gospel for the glory of God. Well, if you have your Bibles, we are going to turn to Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21. Um, for Charlottetown, who are joining us today, over this past year, we have been um, walking through the Sermon on the Mount, uh, probably, well, the greatest, arguably the greatest sermon ever preached, and that is by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When he preached through Matthew 5 to 7, he preached this sermon about what kingdom life looks like in the world. How is the gospel lived out? What is the good news and how does it apply to our lives? And so we've been walking through the Sermon on the Mount. We spent the majority of the summer looking at prayer uh, in Matthew chapter 6 and we're continuing on uh, in Matthew chapter 6 and into Matthew chapter 7. And uh, we're, we've just been uh, gleaning so much from the words of Christ in his word. So let me read God's word for us this morning as we look at Matthew chapter 6 verses 19 to 21 and then we will pray and then we will look at what this means for us. Matthew chapter 6 verses 19 to 21 says this, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let's pray. God, this is your word. We believe and we trust that, Lord, these are living words because they've come alive in Christ Jesus. Heaven's true treasure and Lord, we ask that in this day, you would open our hearts and our minds to what you have to say to us for the glory of who you are in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus promises true riches, true treasures. Now, I want to say to you something this morning that might seem a little odd for it to be coming in some ways from me. Jesus and I want you to be rich. Now, before you think I'm heading into prosperity theology, and before you start thinking, oh, great, now I can go buy that lottery ticket because Jesus wants me to be rich, um, and let me explain what is being said here. Jesus and I want you to be rich. Think about that for a moment. Let that fill your thoughts and your minds. What does that look like for you? When you think of riches, do you think about money? Do you think about possessions? Are you thinking about fame? Do you think about having friendships and deep relationships? What does that mean for you? And I would argue for you this morning, perhaps what riches means for you is not so much the things that they are represented by, the money, the stuff, the possessions. Rather, what is it? Rather, maybe it's those riches that we call riches. Maybe it's what they mean to us that we value. Total satisfaction. See, in our world today, rich is code for happy, having what you want, 
having what you think it is you need. And we are prone in this world to use things for security, for comfort, for power, for significance. What we're really looking for, I would argue, in our earthly treasures, in our definition of rich, what we're looking for is happiness. If I just had that one thing, I would be happy. If I just could get this, get there to where that person is, I would be happy. Are we happy? Are we happy by the things that we pursue? And even if you could say yes, yes, I'm, I'm actually quite happy where I'm at right now. I'm happy with the life that I've led. I'm happy with the way that I've lived my life. I'm thankful for the things I have, the relationships I have, the family. Even if you could say yes to that, I am happy. Is that happiness for you secure? Is it secure? And is it really happiness if it isn't? If at any moment that could be taken from you? If at any moment the relationships you have, the possessions you have could be taken from you by something that maybe happens this afternoon or tomorrow or next week? Is that really happiness? See, but we believe in this world that happiness in this life is about getting, and not just getting, but keeping what it is we get. It's about attaining and maintaining happiness. And these are the cause of so much anxiety and worry. So much anxiety and worry comes down to this. The things that we think will bring us happiness, either we don't have or we can't keep. We don't have or we can't keep. Because the things that we think will bring us happiness, well, even when we get them, we realize they're not enough. And they don't last. There's something that always evades us. Something that always evades us. And the reality is we don't have the whole picture on what true happiness is. So we go from one thing to another, looking for happiness, looking for treasure. We don't have the complete perspective because we only see our lives here. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We need someone to give us complete perspective. We need someone who can give us the whole picture. We need revelation from someone who sees the big picture. And that's why Christ has come. Jesus is God in the flesh. He is the true revelation of God and man about what true humanity looks like, what God really is and looks like. And he's come to give us whole perspective on life. And in Matthew 6, verses 19 to 34, Jesus talks a lot about anxiety and worry. And he, he shows us that our anxiety and our worries are not simply the result of negative thinking, as if the, what could make you less anxious or less worried is just think positively. That's very much what our world proclaims. You just need to think positive. That's going to help things work out. In the end, doesn't matter what you're walking through, think positively. Jesus in Matthew chapter 6 verses 19 to 34 goes deeper than that. And he says the reason why we are, we are bound with so much anxiety and worries is because, not because we're thinking negatively. It's because we're thinking untheologically about life. What that means is we are thinking in a way that doesn't include God in the picture. We're thinking so much about ourselves. We're thinking so much about our lives and what we want and what we need that we have such a limited perspective on what this life is all about. It's a complex life. And we must look to the one who has created it, who's in charge of it. 
Psalm 10 verse 4 says that the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They have no room in their lives for God. And so they jump from one thing to the next. And then Jesus in the passage today, verses 19 to 21, talks about treasure and how God is very involved in our, per, in our value system, how we view and perceive treasure. And Jesus says that our value system, if it's fixed on things on earth, it's mixed up because we truly can't see what it is we're missing. And because we have a limited perspective, we have misplaced treasure. Jesus says in verse 19, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. See, the things of this world aren't deep enough to truly satisfy you. They don't really last. Moth and rust, that word rust there is actually the original word is the word eat. It's eaten away where moth and things are eaten decay, they depreciate in value. And even if you get something of value, it says that you can't maintain it, you can't keep it because thieves break in and, and take away. They break in and steal. The things of this world are not deep enough, not lasting enough to truly satisfy you. Now notice what Jesus is not saying. I have to add this disclaimer. Jesus is not saying that you cannot have possessions. Jesus is not saying that you cannot make provisions for the future, that you can't save for the future. Jesus is not saying that. And Jesus is not saying that you cannot enjoy material things. What Jesus is saying is that the problem isn't those things. The problem is your attitude towards those things. The problem is the human heart and how they handle their possessions. We turn good things, good things that God has given, like food and family and all sorts of things, good things, we turn them into ultimate things. And we think this is what can rule and reign over my life. The reality is, they're not lasting, they're not deep enough. There's a story about this 16th century uh, saint named Saint Philip of Neri. And Saint Philip had a young man come to him all excited because his parents, this young man's parents, had agreed to let him study law. And Saint Philip said, okay, what then? And this this man, so excited, just kind of bewildered at the response, he said, well, then I'll become a lawyer. I'll study law and I'll become a lawyer. And then St. Philip again said, what then? The young man, again, more puzzled, said, well, then I'll make money. And then again, St. Philip said, what then? And he went, well, then I could buy a house. Then I can have a carriage and a horse. They didn't have, you know, BMWs back then, you know, for lawyers to drive around in. I could get a carriage and a horse, and I could, this is like the BMW of the 16th century, the carriage and the horse. I can get that, and then I can marry a beautiful woman. Then I can lead a delightful life. St. Philip looked at this young man and said, what then? See, so much of the pursuits in our lives are fixed on thinking that the things that we can get in this life, that we can attain for ourselves and try to maintain for ourselves are going to satisfy us, are going to last. This young man had an earthly perspective. He didn't have an eternal perspective. You've heard the old saying before, right? Money doesn't buy happiness. And here Jesus in verse 20 of Matthew chapter 6 explains why. Because happiness doesn't depend on earthly treasure or earthly wealth. Happiness actually depends on deep and lasting wealth. And that's not found in the material possessions of this world. 
He, Jesus says, don't store up for yourself things from earth, treasures from earth, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. See, Jesus is actually encouraging the pursuit of the right kind of wealth, the right kind of treasure. The treasures that moth and rust and thieves cannot destroy or take away or depreciate the value of. You see, it's only heaven that's immune to the ravages of earthly limits. It's only heaven that is secure, satisfying, and significant. Peter says this in 1 Peter 1.4. He says there is an inheritance for those who believe in Christ. There is an inheritance kept in heaven for us that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Think about that for a moment, friends. How often we get something and we're so excited about it, and the next week or the next month or the next year or a couple of years down the road, we just think, oh, it's gotten old. I'm talking about something that is unfading, imperishable, that will not lose its appeal. See, when Jesus looks at our pursuits and our treasures, I don't think he finds that we value our treasures as, value the pursuits as too much, but rather as too little. They're actually less than what can truly give us satisfaction and significance. How is this possible? Why? Why is heaven so different? Well, it's because of what is absent and what is present. There's something absent in heaven and there's something present there. And there's something absent on earth in our lives and there's something present here. What is present in our lives and in this world is something that limits us. It narrows our perspective. It causes us to treasure limited things above their intended use. It empties ourselves for the sake of self. It separates us from one another and from God. It depreciates in value. It eats away at us. And if we live an earthly life, simply an earthly life, we are missing the presence of someone else, something greater. See, heaven is where there is an absence of decay, of sin. And heaven is where there is the presence of God, deep lasting wealth, true happiness. This is not about stuff. This is about God himself. Friends, the gospel of Jesus Christ is not that you get God's stuff. You get something more. You get God himself. You get God himself. He becomes your true treasure. He becomes your security, your power, your significance, your comfort. Psalm 1611 says that at the, in the presence of God, there is fullness of joy, and at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore, lasting enough and greater than anything you could ever understand or imagine. And you might say, well, that sounds great, but how do I get this? What does it look like for me to lay up for myself treasure? Now, contrary to some beliefs, this is not what we're talking about when we say lay up treasure for ourselves is not a treasury of our own merit, as if God can owe us back for good things. It's not about a treasury of, of our own righteous deeds. Jesus explains in verse 21 that in order to have treasure in heaven, your heart must be there. He says that frame, famous, those famous words that maybe you've heard over and over again, or maybe you're hearing it for the first time. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If you're to have treasure in heaven, your heart must be there. Now, in the Bible, the word heart means more than just flowery feelings or emotions. The word heart means more than just a physical organ. The word heart is actually translated as the seat of yourself. 
the very seat of yourself, where your, the entirety of who you are rests, where it's centered. Like, think about it. When you sit down, you sit down sturdily, right? Hopefully. Hopefully those chairs that you brought with you today are sturdy. You're sitting in a place of rest. You're not moving. Maybe some of you are resting a little bit more than you should be at church on Sunday. But you're secure. You're placed. See, when we talk about where our heart is truly at rest, truly at peace, truly secure, think about that for a moment. What is it that truly brings you peace, brings you hope, brings you security? What is truly present in your heart? What is it that you sit yourself upon in your life? See, treasure that lasts is found where God is and where sin isn't. That's where your heart needs most to be. And so laying up treasure in heaven requires that you give over your heart. You give over your heart. It's about surrender. Surrendering earthly perspectives of comfort, of security, of power, of significance for a heavenly one. And this, Jesus says, is our only security, our only hope that lasts. But friends, I can tell you that in this surrender, the benefits of the treasure far outweigh the cost. Jesus tells a powerful story in the matter of one verse in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, a parable of buried treasure about a man who is walking in a field and comes upon this incredible treasure. And upon finding this treasure in a field, he goes and he sells everything he has in order to buy that field and have that treasure. Now, he sold everything that he possibly had worked for. He got rid of it all that he might have this one treasure, which is far greater. And Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like that treasure buried in a field. And so you might say, okay, well, how can I know? How can I know this is true? I'm going to, as I answer this question, I'm going to call up the music team and we're going to close. But I want to answer this question for you. How is it that I know that this is true? How do I know it's worth the surrender to put, to lay up treasure in heaven, to put my heart on the things that are above, as Paul says in Colossians 3? How can I be truly secure in this treasure? Well, friends, you can believe it not just because God spoke it through his holy word, the Bible. You can believe it because God spoke it with his word become flesh. Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus Christ is God's treasure, his beloved son. He is the revelation of God, as I said before, to his people who has come from heaven so that his people might have heaven, the presence of God to his people. That we who are in Christ might have the presence of God with us and that we might have sin removed from us. That's true treasure. That's true treasure. And in order to give you heaven, Jesus Christ surrendered his heart. He surrendered himself. And he took your sinful heart upon himself. All of the moth, all of the rust, all of the things that eat away at you have eaten away at him. And he's taken upon himself the thievery, the destruction of your wretched, sinful heart. He's taken that upon himself. And on the cross, the full presence of God and sin came to a head and God overcame sin on that day. And on the cross, true love was displayed, true power, true justice, and the grace of God. And it met with the destruction 
the decay, the offensiveness, the putrid reality of sin. That Jesus on the cross reveals how messed up my heart is. That I can't save myself. That Christ on that cross proclaims that Josh Dockstetter needs a savior and needs a Lord. And that day, the battle against sin was won. You see, what you treasure will ultimately require that you die for it. It will take and take and take and take from you. But Jesus Christ is the only treasure who died for you. Jesus Christ is the only treasure who died for you. And so this morning, I want you to be rich. I want you to have treasure, but not the kind of treasure that's found in earthly things. I want you to know the riches, the unsearchable riches of Christ Jesus, to know the presence and power of God in your life and the absence of the things that weigh you down and the absence of those things that would take you away from him, that you may know true riches, that you might treasure Christ with your life, that you might be conformed to his character, that you might increase in faith and love and hope, that you might grow in your knowledge and perspective of Christ that you might point others to him and give freely and earth, of earthly things for the cause of Christ. Because friends, those things are the only investment whose dividends are everlasting. You see, I want you to be so heavenly minded that you are, that it's not that you're of no earthly good. I want you to be so heavenly minded that you're most earthly good. And it's found in the person and work of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. If you don't know him today, if you don't know Jesus as Savior and Lord, why not treasure him? Why not open your heart to him? that you might know him and believe and grow in faith and trust of our Lord. Will you pray with me? Oh God, the things of this world are not enough to satisfy our, our deep hunger, our deep needs. And Lord, heaven is a place where you are present. It's a place where true love of God is found. Heaven is not a place for those who are scared of hell. Heaven is a place for those who love God. And Lord, we proclaim to you that it's your love, it's your compassion, it's your kindness, God, that leads us and opens our heart to love you. And so, Lord, we pray that on all these things, you would be honored and glorified and lifted up in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. Please.